When I look to the future of the coming decades, what I am hopeful for is that our world becomes much more considerate, that we become good stewards of the future, that we become what some people have referred to as good ancestors. When I think about what the next 30 years are gonna look like, it's not that I think about how radically different the place is going to look, but it's about how we all interact with the world, how we all interact with each other in terms of communications, medicine, travel, space exploration, and also in terms of how it is that we now use the resources that we have to make the world a better place for everybody. In the future, we need to have a world that has technologies that are inclusive and that serve a diverse population. And what that means is that upstream in that funnel, we need to have more diverse people working on these things. My hope is that as we look to the future, we start thinking about ourselves as a collective, that we're not going this alone. Moving towards 2050, I think we need to allow for more diversity in the science fields. By expanding that, you get people with ideas that you've never thought about before. And that's so important when it comes to innovation. And to get there though, we do need to provide valuable education to everybody. One of the challenges that we know is hard for the human mind to grasp is to think about the future because the scale of the problems and the opportunities that we face in the future are at that global level. We think about how do we make it local? How do we make it relevant to you? And how do we make it solutions focused? It's really more of a kind of human consciousness, like what is this world that I could be living in that is a world that will sustain itself for my generation and generations to come and a world that will start to heal itself. The primary area of focus is certainly environmental. We are dealing with a range of challenges, including climate change. We're going to need to develop a number of technologies to try to reverse some of these trends. The reason why I work at ITER and that I work in fusion is that I want to see a world that's more peaceful and that has a more optimistic future where, where children aren't growing up and thinking that uh, they're going to lose all the diversity on the planet and that they won't have as many opportunities as, as we have because of climate change. So what I see is every country will have its, its autonomous sources of energy and therefore slowly we can push back the negative effects of climate change and start seeing nature thriving more and have less conflict in the world because we won't be waging wars competing for sources of energy. When it comes to the planet today and what people are doing and companies and industries are doing to clean up the planet, it's actually really awesome. We're cleaning up the giant garbage patch that's in the ocean. It's gonna take a while, but at least we're working on it. But then that brings up things like, okay, now how do we deal with the microplastics that are getting into all the sea life, getting into the water systems? which then eventually get into us. Cleaning up the oceans will take a lot of time. Our oceans is full of plastic, equipped with a lot of smart sensors that can differ plastic from organic matter like fish. The autonomous robot vessels could clean up our oceans. This is an outdoor mobile robot. Basically the sensors on this are able to collect data to understand surrounding. Basically shoots out 64 lines of laser light around the room and measures everything that comes back so it has a map of the world, right? You take that map, you combine it with stereo vision so you can get depth perception uh, and then you can start recognizing objects. There's been some, some tests run collecting cigarette butts or gum because it is able to drive outdoor. When we talk about AI, it's, oh, it's my virtual assistant on my phone or it's this scary technology that's gonna kill us all, it's Skynet but there's so many applications for what we can use it for to identify. There's things um, like AI technology that uses vision, AI vision, to actually identify from landfills what can be recycled, what can't, what can be pulled out, taken somewhere else. And that's very exciting. And that's only going to get better the more that we optimize it, the more that we use it. I'm Matanya Horowitz. I'm the founder and CEO at Amp Robotics. We're using robotics and artificial intelligence to solve 
some of the primary challenges of the recycling business. We've built a vision system on machine learning that lets us identify all these different materials you put in the recycling bin. And we use that to tell robots what to sort out. Today, the primary technology is really people standing around conveyor belts, sorting material by hand. At its core, you're really relying on people to put the right stuff in the recycling bin. When people don't do a good job, either material is lost to the landfill or these recycling facilities have to deal with all sorts of contamination that lowers the quality of these materials. So the vision system is quite effective in that for the main recycling commodity types, it can identify them with very high accuracy. So this will be things like aluminum cans, number one plastics, number two plastics, like milk jugs, things like this. Our robots right now sort of roughly double the speed of a person. As the technology matures, one of the things we're really excited about is that it can handle dirtier and dirtier material streams. The ability to go through these nasty material streams open up the whole set of materials that can be considered available for recycling. We see it as a very incremental process of equipping the recycling facilities. I'm being a little less sensitive to what people put in the recycling bin each, each year, and then it might be located at landfills and things like this. The more you can create an incentive behind diverting material from landfills or from the environment, the better of a business you can make the waste management industry. And this is absolutely critical in the developing world where a lack of waste management infrastructure, a lack of landfills and collection causes people to dump material into the environment. And this is where a huge part of our plastics in the ocean problem comes from. So the more we can create a natural incentive towards harvesting materials, the less of an incentive there is to just dump these materials. So you hear about like bacteria that's able to eat oil to clean up oil spills. Like we're looking for ways to use the developments that we've had in science and technology, all these kind of remarkable innovations, very purposely focused on what we now identify as some of the unintended consequences of previous technology. Everything from climate change to industrial accidents, we can now look at and find ways with present day technology to address those. The word plastic may be can sound badly, but not because of the, the material itself, right? Because other things around it, maybe uh, when we talk about uh, how we deal with plastic waste, but I think that we, we need to remember uh, why plastic was created, right? It's because convenience, it because make uh, people's lives better. I think there are several examples of uh, industries where we can see uh, plastic is fundamental, like medical equipment. Even in our day-by-day -day use, the consumer goods that we have. So uh, when we look to the future, I think that plastic materials will be always there. And what we are looking right now and we are already working on is how to provide innovation around plastic materials, but a sustainable innovation. With we look at the beginning of the process. We are looking how to develop material that are more recyclable. So we can look for several different specifications and look for those ones that are more sustainable. Not thinking that, uh, okay, uh, we are comfortable about the way how we are disposing this material, but we need to be prepared for that. Moving forward, we definitely need to have more interdisciplinary science. And I'd even go as far as saying we need to have a lot of transdisciplinary individuals that have strong knowledge in multiple disciplines and are able to fluently traverse between them uh, to address the sorts of complex problems that we have. Each and every individual on this planet has something to contribute. We all have skills and talents that can be developed and that every one of us should have the opportunity to develop those skills and talents so that we can all contribute to our continued successful existence on the planet. These studies have shown that when you have diverse people working in science and in any kind of innovation, that you get more creative ideas and it leads to, to greater innovation. And it's really just a shame that in a lot of the STEM areas, there aren't enough women working. Um, across the board, it's about 25% we need more women to be involved. I do think that changing the way we do education could be beneficial. Maybe taking a different approach and allowing people's creativity to be prioritized. And a great example of that is actually Albert Einstein, who himself valued imagination above knowledge. And he came up with his most famous theories just by going for a walk in the park 
and letting his imagination soar. The way we currently go about education on this planet is incredibly antiquated and exclusionary. We all think, we all learn, we all integrate, we all pull in information and reprocess that information in a different way. I am a, an obsessive, passionate believer in the power of innovation, but that word has been abused and beaten around, often by corporates and governments. One of those things you should do and put on a poster and say, we're gonna do innovation. Creativity, innovation, all of those things absolutely mean risk. But if you don't take risk, you guarantee failure in the longer term. As we live in a world where science and technology affect so many different parts of our lives, I think that we need to understand that science is a real process, that it starts with an idea, it goes through these you know, steps of testing and engineering and design and failure, and that what we come out with at the end is and the next step in the process, but it's not the end. <laughs> that process keeps going.